one total eclipse of the news cycle, the reaction and the fallout from Friday's episode of The Will Kane Show with Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Two, who could run for vice president in 2024? For that matter, who's going to be running for president in 2024? A conversation with presidential campaign manager Kellyanne Conway. And three, the greatest show on earth. My night at WrestleMania with Mike Guns Gunzelman of Outkick. It is the Will Kane Show, streaming live at foxnews.com on the Fox News YouTube channel, the Fox News Facebook page, and always on demand at Apple or on Spotify. You can as well subscribe under the live stream of this show in the text description. Just hit expand, and there's a button you can subscribe on YouTube to the Will Kane Show. And I would suggest that could be wise because we made a little bit of news on Friday. We made a little bit of news over the weekend. Big weekend for the Will Kane Show. Our interview on Friday, one full hour with Dwayne The Rock Johnson, the most followed man in America, has taken over the national conversation. In that interview, The Rock declined to endorse a presidential candidate in 2024 and said, not that he regretted endorsing Joe Biden, but that he regretted endorsing any political candidate. Now, what does that mean? What was it like sitting down with The Rock? Who is the man that I'm getting to know? I'm going to share you a quick story about the man, if you would indulge me for one second. Last week, um, I called up the president of WWE, a man named Nick Khan. Now, I've known Nick for quite some time because he used to be an agent at CAA. He's now the president of WWE. I called up Nick because as part of our fund to raise money for the survivors of the Lahaina fire, I've gotten to know a boxing ministry. When I say boxing ministry, what I mean is they preach and they train kids physically and spiritually. It's called Contending for the Kingdom. And they, like everybody else in Lahaina, Maui, lost everything burned to the ground. I got to know the leader of Contending for the Kingdom, Dusty Raynum. He was one of the beneficiaries of our fund, Help the People of Maui, Help the People of Lahaina, who so many of you ended up helping by donating over $2.6 million. Our fund has now concluded almost 210 $12,000 grants across Lahaina. But Dusty was still left with what to do with Contending the Kingdom. And I'd spoken to various people out there in the industry who knew something about boxing, and I was hoping to get heavy bags, speed bags, headgear, gloves, donated to getting this thing back up off the ground to build back from the ashes in Lahaina. But I ended up on a phone call last week with Nick Khan, again, the president of WWE. I didn't even get my story out. I, I probably spoke for 30 seconds, and he said, say no more. Let me call you right back. Nick called Dwayne The Rock Johnson. He called Dana White of UFC. They are sister companies under the parent umbrella of TKO. The Rock sits on the board. He's the director. That's why his WrestleMania character is the final boss of TKO. And it was done in moments. It was done in minutes. That boxing ministry this week will have everything it needs delivered. Heavy bags, speed bags, headgear, gloves, wraps, everything needed to minister and train young kids in Lahaina under contending for the kingdom. What I'm telling you is, as we talk today about the political fallout, as the headline that everyone else is focused on, and we will discuss today, I'm not going to pretend to you that I know and I'm best friends with Dwayne Johnson. I'm not. I just have now had the opportunity to speak with him now for roughly an hour and a half over two separate interviews. And all I know is that when someone is presented with the opportunity to do something good and they readily take it, we should take note of the character of that human being. We're tempted to be cynical. We're tempted to look into ulterior motives. I know for a fact that the Rocks People Fund of Maui, which raised $60 million, I believe he contributed the first $5 million. I know for a fact that went to the people of Lahaina. 
I know they receive $1,200 a month for one year. I know the people, including many of Dusty Raynon's friends and family. I know thousands of people in Lahaina that received money from the People's Fund. And I'm just here to tell you not to advocate, not to celebrity worship, not to try to build a new best friend. I'm here to tell you the truth. And the truth is when people are presented with the opportunity to do good, we take note. And Dana White and Nick Khan and Dwayne The Rock Johnson have done good for the people of Maui and Lahaina. Now, what does that mean for politics? What's that mean for everything else everyone's talking about today? We're going to dive into that in just a little bit here on The Will Cain Show, including diving into something I promise does not disappoint. I know everyone says, wrestling, isn't that for kids? Wrestling, that's when I was a kid. I'm here to tell you, if you're into entertainment, and you're into a show, there is no better show than WrestleMania. My first experience last night in Philadelphia. Now, will the total eclipse of the sun live up to the same type of expectation? The entire nation within the next hour and a half to two hours is waiting to see the sky darken, the sun blotted out by the moon. The entire nation is waiting for the total eclipse. Um... The crew here on The Will Cain Show, two days Dan, Young Establishment James, and Tinfoil Pat are under at least some direct threat, not from the darkness, but from their position on The Will Cain Show, because Tinfoil Pat is our resident peer beneath the covers, understand what everything is really happening in America. Well, my 12-year-old son intends to take that position. He tells me they're up to something, earthquakes, bridges collapsing, highways shutting down, Eclipse. He tells me, look over here while something else happens over there. This kid is not on X. He's not on TikTok. He's not on social media. He's not on anything. And he's coming for you. He's coming for you, tinfoil pad. He also tells me I rip off all of his takes. I once had a conversation with you about the fact that Domino's pizza is underrated. He says I directly cribbed that without giving him credit, that take here on the Will Kane Show. Said I've been eating Domino's pizza long before you were born, son. But you might be onto something here with the eclipse. So I don't know if we can look directly up there or not. Conflicting evidence, conflicting testimony. Can we look? Do we need to wear our glasses? I I don't know exactly if this is going to underwhelm or or, or meet expectations, but here at the end of the Will Can Show, we, I, we're all going to walk outside. Me in Dallas, Texas, where it's overcast and promises to disappoint, but is directly in the path of the total eclipse, and we will be figuring out, does it live up to WrestleMania? In fact, let's dive in to the news that drove the weekend. Dwayne The Rock Johnson with story number one. On Friday's episode of the Will Kane Podcast, which you can watch on YouTube, one full hour. I highly encourage you to listen to the one full hour because on social media, all you will hear is clips. Clips like the following when I asked Dwayne how he felt about his endorsement in 2020 of Joe Biden and how he felt about the state of America. Listen. Are you happy that you made that endorsement in 2020? Are you happy with the state of America? Am I happy with the state of America right now? Well, that answer is no. Do I believe we're going to get better? I I believe in that. I'm an optimistic guy, and I I believe we can get better. Um, The endorsement that I made uh, years ago with Biden was one I thought was the best decision for me at that time. And I thought back then when we talk about, hey, you know, I'm in this position uh, where I have some influence and it's my job then. I felt like that then. It's my job now to exercise my influence and share with this. This is who I'm going to endorse. Am I going to do that again this year? That answer is no. Let's start with cynicism. Let's start with what that conversation has been turned into. The headlines screamed on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and even this morning today in outlets like Vanity Fair that Dwayne The Rock Johnson regrets endorsing Joe Biden. That characterization, that distillation of our one-hour conversation has been treated with a community note on X. He did not say to me that he regrets endorsing Joe Biden. He did say he regrets making any political endorsement. It has been turned into every headline screaming, 
he regrets endorsing Joe Biden. So much so that outlets like The View played that clip to the response of an overwhelming chorus of boos towards The Rock from those sitting in attendance before Whippy Goldberg and Joy Behar. Joy Behar going on to say, should we care about celebrity endorsements? Apparently lacking any self-awareness that the entire show, The View, is based upon the idea that something matters because it's said by a celebrity. But I also think there's many who are treating this moment with cynicism in that they are saying The Rock is simply doing this because now it's good for business. He's now involved in WWE. He now wants a more conservative audience. And I can't tell you another man's motivations. I can't tell you why there was no further conversations behind the scenes besides those which you see on camera that would have shed light on that conversation. But I can't peer into someone else's soul. But I can tell you, even if that cynicism is warranted, even if Joe Biden wasn't rejected by the Rock. Even if Dwayne Johnson doesn't regret endorsing Joe Biden, it is notable. It is important. I'm going to tell you why, as now you listen to a little more of Dwayne's explanation as to why he will not make an endorsement in 2024. But I also realized that what that caused back then was something that tears me up in my guts back then and now, which is division. And that got me. And I didn't realize it then. I just thought, hey, our country feels like there's a lot of unrest. It feels like I would like things to calm down. Maybe we need a change. This is what I'm going to do. And this is who I'm going to endorse. The takeaway after that, months and months and months, I started to realize like, oh man, that caused an incredible amount of uh, division in our country. So I realize now going into this election, I'm not going to do that. I wouldn't do that because my goal is to bring our country together. Here's why I think it is more than notable. Here's why I think this conversation actually deserves the new cycle that it drove without having to say that he regrets endorsing Joe Biden. I heard Mary Catherine Hamm on the Megyn Kelly show say, what this actually represents is a change, a shift in what is seen as normal, in the mindset of the quote unquote normie, in what has been normalized. You see, she explained, The Rock is at least, despite his celebrity and being the most followed man in America, normal adjacent. And I think she's right, having been around him, on a couple of occasions. I think his instinct, his gut, his background, his upbringing puts him in a position where he doesn't come off as someone who was raised in celebrity culture. He doesn't come off as someone attempting to be elite. He comes off as someone who wants to be in touch with Americans. And I think that in 2020, most normies saw, for better or for worse, saw whether or not they should have Joe Biden as a return to normalcy. However we feel, those that support or those that detract from Donald Trump, it was an aberration from the norm. And for many of us, that was a good thing because the norm has been corrupted. So what Joe Biden sold himself as in 2020 was a blank slate. He had hidden the basement. He didn't take any strong positions. He allowed the election to be a referendum on Donald Trump. And to win over normal voters, Donald Trump was painted as abnormality. What we see now is a change in the Joe Biden's administration and the overall ideology of the left, and by extension then, Democrats, is that it's no longer normal. After three and a half years of trans ideology and $35 trillion in debt and an exploded border, a culture that has been divided upon not only racial lines but gender lines and trans lines is sitting on a razor's edge of divisiveness and it's the exact opposite of what is sold in 2020 it's anything but normal and as someone who is normal adjacent i think what the rock represents is an american who now sees we can't have this this path is not what was sold this path is not normal and look in hollywood declining to endorse joe biden even if he's going to behind the scenes vote for Joe Biden, 
is almost the same as an endorsement of Donald Trump. That's what you saw on The View, because they're still living in this insane world that Donald Trump represents a threat to democracy, that Donald Trump represents the threat to their daughters, that there's going to be a national abortion ban, something explicitly rejected today by Donald Trump. So they will see that world, that elite poisoned culture, will see that statement, that lack of endorsement of Joe Biden as the same as an endorsement of Donald Trump. But it's not. What I think it represents is a shift in what is seen as normal. And I think that's important. I don't think the world breaks down into left and right. I don't think the world is ideological. I, I hearken back to the conversation we had on the Will Cain show here with my friend and who is a very successful trial attorney who talks about how they've impaneled mock juries. And he said they don't go in there and there has never in his career been a situation like 12 Angry Men. What they want to do is get along. And the first person that takes a strong stand defines the jury. Game, set, match within five minutes. The first person who plants a flag dictates the opinions of the remaining 10 or 11 because they will fall in line with their instinct to be to get along, to be normal. And what we're seeing is, importantly, a shift in what is seen as normal. And by that token, I would also say, therefore, the cynicism that The Rock could be doing this for business is also important because business saw that what was good for business was to embrace Joe Biden. That's what has been normal in America. But we're seeing a shift away from that now. Even if it's not a true believer, even if it has nothing to do with ideology, even if it seems to be measuring the pulse of America, it shows a shift in what is normal in America. And because of that, I think this moment is incredibly important. I think what we heard from Dwayne The Rock Johnson deserves the nation's attention over the past 72 hours. I think we, it represents a deep and important, if not ideological, change in what is normal in America. I encourage you, go listen to the full hour of that conversation. It's deep. I think you, you'll learn more about the man. I think you'll learn about the legacy. I think you'll learn about the business of Wrestle WWE and wrestling and the experience of WrestleMania. And I think you'll even begin to understand that at the heart of everything, movies, Hollywood, politics, culture, when you distill it all down, you will get to Cody Rhodes versus Roman Reigns. You will get to WrestleMania. When you distill it all down, you will get to WWE. More of that coming up in just a little bit here on The Will Cain Show. But let's see if I'm right. Let's see if this moment is big for America. Let's talk to former presidential campaign manager Kellyanne Conway next on The Will Cain Show. Fox News Podcast Network. I'm Emily Campagno, and this is the Fox True Crime Podcast. And I had nothing to do with her disappearance, but people still accuse me of it. I sit down with the people who lived the nightmares. I was in shock. I was just devastated. The investigators who tirelessly worked on the case. I feel for their families, and I really hope that they can catch this guy. Bringing you closer to the story than you ever thought possible. Listen and follow now at foxnewspodcasts.com or wherever you get your podcasts. You're being watched. Crime Cam 24-7 is back with new episodes only on Fox Nation. Hey, criminals, we're still watching. Sean Sticks Larkin returns to the show where every shot tells a different story. But every frame uncovers the truth. The Buckle up, America. Crime Cam 24-7 returns. New episode Friday on Fox Nation. Sign up at foxnation.com. All part of Fox Justice on Fox Nation. Sign up and get your first year of Fox Nation for $29.99. America is streaming. From the Fox News Podcasts Network. Hey there, it's me, Kennedy. Make sure to check out my podcast, Kennedy Saves the World. It is five days a week, every week. We check in with Jimmy Fallon, bring in authors for The Book Club, and even treat some of your favorite Fox personalities to a very special happy hour. Download and listen at foxnewspodcast.com or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Kennedy Saves the World. America is listening to Fox News.
A lot of comments in the chat suggesting we're at the end times. Earthquakes and eclipse. Prepare. Get right with God. Also forwarded by my, I guess, new conspiracy theorist son. And others suggesting Johnson Cain 2028. We'll just see. But what is viable to run for president in 2028? It is the Will Cain Show, streaming live at foxnews.com, the Fox News YouTube channel, the Fox News Facebook page, and always available on demand when you subscribe to the Will Cain Show on YouTube or on Apple or on Spotify. Let's uh, look at 2024. Let's look at vice president. Let's look at president. And let's look at 2028 with presidential campaign manager and counselor and Fox News contributor Kellyanne Conway here on The Will Cain Show. Hey, Kellyanne. And Will Cain friend. How are you doing, Will? I'm good. I'm glad to have you on the show today. I think you're the perfect guest to talk about what drove the news cycle for the past 72 hours over the weekend. And it is something that happens right here on The Will Cain Show. It is that Dwayne The Rock Johnson um, declined to repeat his endorsement for Joe Biden in 2024. I'm curious, having been inside campaigns, Kellyanne, how important do you think it is or how unimportant is it do you think it is that a celebrity is big, and he's the most followed man in America, a celebrity is big of the rock um made that statement to me here about joe biden it's huge and i was also at link lincoln financial field in philadelphia watching wrestlemania xl on saturday night and of course the final piece of the show piece of the uh, program was the rock going out there in the ring so i think it's incredibly important will because he didn't just unendorse joe biden and go quietly into the night he explained why he said he's not doing that again for two main reasons. Number one, he thinks that Joe Biden has divided America. And number two, he's so tired of woke. And I know he said many other things to you and to others who have interviewed him, but it's incredibly important when somebody stands up, speaks up, puts up, and shows up. And he did that politically. You have a lot of celebrities who don't like Donald Trump, who endorsed Joe Biden, endorsed Hillary Clinton, gave them money, et cetera, who then sort of, if you ask them, Hey, what do you think of Kamala Harris? Or, hey, what do you think of Joe Biden's ability, agility, and acuity? They want to talk to you about your kids and the weather. The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, came out and is forcibly, forcefully telling people why he made a mistake and won't do it again. And uh, you hear that from many voters. I think when you see so many of the core constituencies of the Democratic Party and the Democratic electorate, leaving Joe Biden, considering voting for Donald Trump, obviously Hispanic Americans, African Americans, young people, some women, political independence, definitely. If you listen to them tell you why, it, it sort of mirrors what Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, is saying. You know, Kellyanne, I have to say after that conversation, I didn't come away with the impression of, oh, he's going to vote for Donald Trump. I don't know which way he's going to vote. Um, and he said to me specifically, what, that will be private between me and the ballot box. But it, it does, you know, it does, I don't know if you heard what I just had to say, does that still represent to me this deeper cultural shift in America, which is, you know, big business, um, even if he were doing it for, bu for business, or celebrity, even if he were doing it to broaden his audience, or um, even if he's just simply someone kind of in touch with, and as you point out, you were at WrestleMania, and that is America. Like, WWE is America. Even if he's someone in touch with America, I think it still represents a shift because for the better part of, I would say, and, and you could address this better, but at least eight years, anything that, forget conservative, forget Donald Trump, anything that wasn't far left was described right. as crazy. That's anything right. that wasn't, Anything that didn't, you know, full-throatedly endorse Joe Biden was seen as a threat to democracy. And that's what they're still saying on The View. And that's why they're criticizing him. They're not criticizing him because he endorsed Donald Trump. They're criticizing him because he's not endorsing Joe Biden, and therefore he's potentially open, they're saying, to a future that destroys democracy. And I think what this moment represents is— no one's buying what you're selling anymore. Right. You're losing normal America. Your crazy prism of the world is not a monopoly view of America. And there's a reason for that. People know what they see with their own two eyes, Will. So we can go with what the Democrats say to us is true, or we can go with what we see to be true. And I trust Americans and their essential wisdom and their eyesight to know what they see and to vote on it. That's what's happened with the border. Now, years ago, nine years ago, when Donald Trump elevated the border into the national consciousness, 
he he met with international criticism and ridicule. He was called names. Uh, you're 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 never going to win. We're going to win Hispanics forevermore as Democrats. The opposite has happened, because many Americans now are saying, "Well, hold on." I'm watching what's happening. You're letting over 8 million people in roughly population larger than 39 states in this country. And they're coming here. And that's not that's not fair. That's illegal. But then they're saying, and when they get here, you give them cash, cell phones, clothing, shelter. You give them my kid's seat in the classroom in the second grade in New York City. This is not just fair. This is un-American. And this is not the way things are supposed to be. We are a compassionate, generous nation among the most, uh, absolutely the be- the most in the nations in the world's history. You can come here legally, 34 million and counting have. So people are watching this. They're, yes, they're watching groceries and gas increase. They're watching crime. They're watching Ukraine. They're watching Israel. But they're also being called names themselves because of their political beliefs. You have a president of the United States and Joe Biden who has said MAGA, mega MAGA, who with a Marine behind him stationed in Philadelphia, gave an official speech as our commander in chief to basically castigate and denigrate a very large percentage of our nation. We can't have a president that does that. And so people are rising up. They're also, and this is why I will, I also say like, you can talk about Joe Biden's bumbling, stumbling, mumbling, but everybody sees that the art of politics is not to tell people what they can see, but what they can't. And what they can't see is that we can't maybe don't remember is his chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan, killing those Keystone pipeline jobs on week one out of spite, how he has emboldened a nuclear capable Iran, delisting the terrorist groups as terrorist groups and saying, let's get back in the JCPOA. So I think everywhere you look, people know this is a man-made crisis, but it only takes a few rocks in the world, the rocks in the world. Honestly, Dwayne Johnson's to say, hey, I endorsed him last time for a reason. I'm not doing it this time for the following reasons. Um, You know, last point, I think it doesn't get enough coverage that one of the reasons, and you touched on this before I came on today, so I want to mention it. One of the reasons that Hispanic Americans and Asian Americans and even African Americans are leaving Democrats and considering voting Republican, if not for Donald Trump, in addition to the border and crime and public safety and the schools and certainly uh, the, the war, the economy, It's the open hostility to religion and religious people that the Democratic Party has displayed for years now. They don't realize that if you walk into a Catholic church on a Sunday in many of our suburbs, you see the pews filled with multi-generations of Hispanic Americans and and Asian Americans. African Americans are worshiping for hours at a time in their churches. Uh, And and so if that's the way you spend your Sundays, if that's very important to you in your life and your decision-making process and your values, it's going to be important to your politics as well. And the Democratic Party is openly hostile to religion. Prove me wrong. They offer thoughts now. They can't even say thoughts and prayers. So you said so much there that I want to respond to, but one of the things I want to say is, and we'll leave The Rock here in that interview, and again, you can go watch the whole thing, the full hour on YouTube, or listen to it on Spotify or Apple, is that he said to me, look, the same, he said the same thing you did, Kellyanne, and it's something that's like really core to who I am and why I do this and what I believe. He said to me, I believe in Americans. Like, I do. I, I believe in the inherent goodness and capability of Americans. And look, I don't like making things overly partisan, but that's not the message you receive when you listen to Democrats. It's almost like this, this disdain for Americans, this scolding, um, this scolding, we need to change towards Americans. I just believe in the fundamental goodness and capabilities of American. So do you. And by the way, so does Dwayne Johnson. But now I want to move to this because you started to go here back to the normalcy thing. I think it is reflected in what you said. And we did it on Fox and Friends weekend this past weekend. Black voters have dropped from 90 percent support to I believe it is 68 or 61 percent. It's a huge drop in support for Joe Biden. Hispanic voters now below 50 percent. And here's a big one. Young voters, the voters under 30, he's shed another 10 percent among young voters. And so. I think you have highlighted to us all the reasons for that being the case, that he is bleeding all of these voters. What I want to ask you, though, is what is the fallout from that, Kellyanne? So Joe Rogan on his podcast made a prediction, and I have no idea that he would have any insight. But he said by May, his prediction was May, they will replace Joe Biden, and it will be Gavin Newsom, Kamala Harris. Do you think Joe Biden will still be the Democratic nominee for president in 2024? 
I do. I mean, the odds are that he will be. I understand you do a switcheroo. It's actually easier under the Democratic Party rules to do that than it would be in the Republican Party. Um, but they're running out of time and they're so invested in Joe Biden. Let's just say, Will, that they replace Joe Biden with someone else. Do you think that the rest of us aren't going to make whoever he or she is eat and own all of the Biden policies? And the fact that whoever that is never stood up, never stood in the breach and said, hold on, this party's going in the wrong direction. We are so far out of sync now with where America is on spending government money that we don't have on things we don't need, uh, what they've uh, obviously done with defunding the police, what they're doing with the foreign wars, the border, the list goes on and on. So what Democrat is going to be able to stand up and confidently and competently tell America, tell these swing voters, Will, that I, I'm the one who went against Joe Biden. No, you didn't. You're the one who replaced him. There's a big difference. And if it's someone like Gavin Newsom, pff, we add onto his shoulders all the failings and flailings of a beautiful state called California that he's presided over. So I understand why they want to get rid of him. My advice to Democrats would have been, was get rid of Biden and Harris a year ago, roll the dice, probably lose the presidency in 2024, but make Donald Trump the face of the opposition and rebuild your party back to what it was, the party of the worker, the party of uh, the downtrodden, those who literally are in the minority numbers wise in our nation and the party um, that was always looked upon as you know, a little bit more reasonable than they are now and always elevating and electing young people, JFK, Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, even Jimmy Carter, God bless him, Will, he's 99 now, but he was 52 when he was elected. That's a young man. And and so 52. now they've got back to back Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden. So it makes no sense. But I, I hear you completely. But how in the world would they do that? And the big question is, are you also getting rid of Kamala Harris? Because she's even less popular than Joe Biden. And I will tell you right now, what scares many people, even some who have a tiny little bit of sympathy for Joe Biden is a vote for Joe Biden is a vote for Kamala Harris, possibly for 12 years. That scares many people. My only rebuttal is that there are no good answers to the questions you ask, but the answer that you're left with is one that just increasingly looks like certain laws, Joe Biden. And by the way, on Gavin Newsom, I hear you. Like, on paper, you have to own the Democratic policies of the last four years, plus you have to own California. On paper, that's an obvious loser. But I will say I do not underestimate Gavin Newsom. I do not underestimate his ability to get before a podium with a bad set of facts and spin his lies and ways into a win. I think he is in that way. This isn't a compliment. In that way, he is a very good politician. I just do not underestimate Gavin Newsom. No, I don't at all. And he obviously wants a future in democratic politics. And I think he did a smart thing by telling the Biden team, I'm going to be a surrogate for you, raise money for you. He showed up at the Fox News debate in Simi Valley in his home state of California, the Reagan Library, uh, went on a couple of Fox shows, has given an interview uh, to Sean Hannity, has debated Ron DeSantis on Fox News. Pretty clever on his part. Um, but I think the, why wouldn't he have also decided by now, like, I can't be the person who shoves out the first female vice president of color. Uh, someone else has to do that. I'm not going to do that. And so um, it would have to be something that Biden agrees to. It would have to be something Kamala is comfortable with. And even then, I just still think it's it's back to your original point, which is the Democratic Party, not just Joe Biden. The Democratic Party has veered so far, of course, to where it once was, but also from where America is. And I don't understand that. Biden's got enough reasonable, smart people around him. The only thing I can say is that the prospect of Donald Trump coming back to office so infects the brains and the bodies of otherwise decent people that they say and do things they can't possibly believe or possibly think is in the best interest of America. The best example I have is the one that most Americans are telling pollsters like me now in focus groups and in quantitative polling will is the most important issue to them, which is the border. They just don't understand. And remember, an open border is a proxy for many things. It's a proxy for economic unfairness. It is a proxy for um, national sovereignty, for security, safety, fairness, the drug crisis, fentanyl, the number one killer of 18 to 45 year olds in our nation. So it's, and yet the Biden people have to be reading the same polls the rest of us are. His approval rating, his disapproval rating in terms of handling issues, worse. The worst one for him is um, his handling of the border, second to his handling of the Israel Hamas war. So the border he inherited, the Israel Hamas war fairly new. 
And on both of them, he's just struggling mightily. And the two things that they're going to attempt to run on, what, what it appears to be, is that Donald Trump represents a threat to democracy and that Donald Trump is going to push a national abortion ban. Now, that looks like something that was undercut today by Donald Trump. He put out a statement, he put out a position on, on abortion, um, w- in which he said, I want exceptions for rape, incest, and the life of the mother. And he also wanted it left up to democracy and a state-by-state basis. So, you know, when I did the interview with The Rock and the way people on the left have distilled that, they're like, oh, okay, I guess The Rock, if he's not going to endorse Joe Biden, is okay with, you know, a national abortion ban. Does that put an end? Does Donald... Tell me what you think of Donald Trump's positioning on abortion. Does it neuter the left, one of the left's two big arguments? And what does it do on the right? First of all, he is the most pro-life president in history. It took a true convert, a Manhattan male billionaire real estate executive for whom most of his adult life had been pro-choice, became the most passionate, emphatic, and active, action-oriented pro-life president in American history. First president, much to my surprise, Will, First president to ever address the March for Life in person. He did it several times. I was there. So, and then all the gains. And he starts out today's video saying, I um, I want to reaffirm my support for IVF and went back to the Alabama example. Then he said, um, I'm why Roe versus Wade was overturned. I did that. It's my three justices. He said that many times. So he is reaffirming his commitment to Roe no longer being the law of the land, which means there's no con- uh, federal constitutional right to have an abortion. What Justice Alito said in the Dobbs case almost two years ago, Will Cain, is that this issue should go back to the elected representatives who are closest to the people. He did not say you can't have a federal minimum standard, like say 15 weeks, so that babies in Gavin Newsom's California or J.B. Pritzker's Illinois or Kathy Hochul's New York, for example, Um, Don't die at 34, 35, 39 weeks, which is the law. Uh, But I think President Trump, and I talked to him this morning after he put out the statement. I certainly talked to him along the way before the statement. Um, He wasn't hearing from a lot of United States senators and Senate candidates that they were going to put that on his desk as president. Now, if they change their minds and they do that, then perhaps it's different. But right now, right here, he removed... Uh, the left's lie should have removed their lie that he's for some kind of big ban and that the states don't have any rights. They still are lying about him. Um, they're still lying that he wants to ban abortion. But I don't question that he's pro-life, and I think he should be credited as pro-life. And there are lots of pro-lifers. Um, I'm one of the. I mean, I am a thousand percent pro-life. Uh, but that's just not where the country is. And I think to move hearts and minds, we should be talking about 15 weeks. If for nothing else, as a conversation starter, why? If Kamala Harris in the vice presidential debate is at 39 weeks, ask her a couple simple questions. So you know my exceptions. What are yours? Name your exceptions. Uh, There are babies being born, Kamala Harris, in your home state of California at 24 weeks, 23 weeks. They have names. Here are their names. Three years old, five years old, seven years old now. They're citizens of California like you are, Vice President Harris. Could we get you from 39 weeks to the point at which they were born in your own state? And if people say, well, that's not pro-life, you're not listening, everybody. I got it. But that's not where the country is. To get them there eventually is to show them that the left are a bunch of science deniers. They knew enough to mask up your five-year-old kid for the better part of two school years, but you show them a five-month-old sonogram, like, I don't know what it is. It's like, let me help you. That's the male organ and the baby sucking his thumb and waving at you. So I know a lot of pro-lifers will be very disappointed today, but also if you're in one of the states, and there are many that have no abortions except for life of the mother, South Dakota, I believe Arkansas, a bunch of others, then President Trump just said to you, that was your right. Uh, in, in the state of Florida, there's now two things. It's either the six weeks that Ron DeSantis signed into law as governor, or it's his new ballot initiative, which as I read it, has no guardrails at all. They, they're saying, would, do you agree or disagree with a state constitutional right to an abortion? And someone's going to say, well, yes, but there are no exceptions in what I read. And so that would be worse position than pre-Dobbs. But I think it's important for him to reaffirm a cultural life. And I will tell you that there are a lot of senators and Senate candidates and House candidates and others, and certainly there are consultants telling them, this is why you lost in 2022. It's never because of the consultants, by the way. This is why you lost in 2022. You're going to lose again in 2024 unless this is taken off the table and we talk about states' rights. But I will give this little warning. 
for those who are running and for Senate and saying, or House and saying, states' rights, states' rights only, then you have to ask yourself why you're talking about school choice and charter schools and school board elections and policing and crime. Those aren't just states' issues. Those are local issues. And I want everybody to talk about everything. I want us to talk all day long about how the left defunded the police. But that's not a federal issue, is it? It's a state issue. It's actually a local issue. So we have to be a little bit careful. And I think at the same time, we have to create this culture of life at all times. And President Trump, I believe, and someone who knows him well, worked side by side with him as the most pro-life president in American history and someone I talked to today. I believe he's going to continue, as he did in that video, for fight for life and, and a culture of life. I believe life begins at conception. Not everyone in this country believes that. You spoke to him this morning. Um, you worked with him side by side in the past. Will you formally work side by side again with Donald Trump? Let's see what my best and highest use is. Um, obviously, I worked for the country while working for President Trump and Vice President Pence. And I want to make sure that whatever I'm doing um, serves the country the best I can. But I think, and President Trump says this all the time because there's all these stories about personnel and this one and the other one. He says all the time, said it to me recent, very recently, everybody has to put their head down and win. And I don't work for his campaign. Mm -hmm. um, we're very close to him, very proud of the work we did in 2016, very critical of his 2020 campaign. I think 2024 for President Trump is the best combination, Will Kane, because he has that hunger, swagger, underestimated, underdog, you know, feistiness and ethos back with a presidential record that you can compare to Biden's record. And he's going to have enough of the funding. And he's got these swing state polls going his way. He's got a lot of folks who didn't vote for him before or didn't vote for him in 2020, at least, who are giving him a second look. Biden has a little bit of advantage on the money right now. The Democrats have a huge advantage on the mechanics and the process and the ground game. Hopefully that's turning around. But I fear that they who control the mechanics and process control the outcomes. And yeah, uh, that, is just, that, that just means that they're getting people out there ballot harvesting and early voting and all of that. They're more interested in that process and power than ideology and policy, you know, for whom to vote philosophically and why, meaning for uh, policy-wise, why. They're more, I mean, they gave us Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, John Fetterman in the space of a, a, two years. So they're not even pretending to want the most qualified people to hold public office. And we should believe them when we see them. I really like when you say Will Kane, when you use my first name and last name. It's like you've grabbed me by the lapel and say, listen to this point, Will. It's short of really Kelly talking to you now. the whole thing, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, last thing with you, Kellyanne, um, then I'm going to ask you, and then you can answer it how you want. Who's going to be, who's going to run with Donald Trump as vice president? So I think more important than who is is what. What is the job description? Who do we, who, what does he need? First and foremost, it should be somebody who helps him win and helps him govern. And that also means that he or her, uh, he or she, excuse me, is not a distraction. President Trump should not be held to account for the vice president's statements or record or anything else. So that kind of trims the list. Uh, I wrote an op-ed in the uh, New York Times a month or two ago talking about how he should definitely look at um, candidates of color. So I know he's considering Byron Donalds or Marco Rubio and some others. Um, I, there, He certainly has other, he has some women on the list. He has some governors, some senators on the list. He has some business people on the list. Uh, my new favorite, though, is to put on the list is Bill Haggerty, the senator from Tennessee, who um, helped us during transition, went over and served as the U.S. ambassador to Japan, our third largest economy. So he knows an awful lot about China. Uh, former businessman, uh, had you know helped to run and, and build the Boston Consulting Group, and now a United States senator from Tennessee. Why did I say this? He's really good on TV. He's great on all the issues. He has a businessman sense. I think he could beat Kamala Harris badly in a debate. And I feel like when Air Force Two pulls up in any foreign nation and, and Senator Haggerty and some others, the plane, um, we would feel proud. We'd say, okay, I have confidence in his competence. I'm not a big fan of you need a woman, you need a minority, you need somebody this age, you need somebody... We need somebody who's qualified. Joe Biden showed us the cost and consequence that we as a nation pay every day, Will Kane, for saying, I need a woman, I need a woman, I need a woman. You can pick a woman if you want, but uh, it can't be anyone like Kamala Harris. And so that's, so that's what we're up against. Here's what I, I like. Donald Trump has an embarrassment of riches. I put in my op-ed Mike Pompeo, Marco Rubio, Tom Cotton, um, Katie Britt, Sarah Sanders, Christina, you know, they're all in there. And then some people are recommending the Dick Cheney model. 
somebody who wouldn't compete with Donald Trump and, and look at, you know, look at 2028 as their own. Uh, so that's that's more like the Ben Carson idea. And I think J.D. Vance is still on his list as well, the senator from Ohio, even though he's new to the Senate and I think doing a very good job there. I think he voted for Evan McMullen. Right, he's important. Yeah. He's important in the Senate. Um, yes. But that's actually where I was going to go. One name you didn't say is a name. That's fascinating what you just said about Haggerty. So, um, and, and something I hadn't considered. I have always thought that Tim Scott probably checked a lot of the boxes that you had oh, described. Yeah, um Okay, you just maybe just overlooked his sorry. name. Sorry, uh, yeah, he's um, obvious, sorry, he's on the list, and he's in my op-ed, of course, and he's a great. He's and a he great doesn't person. compete with Donald. He doesn't compete with Donald Trump. Like he's not going to cause. Like you, the first thing you said is somebody that doesn't detract. Tim Scott's not going to detract from Donald Trump. But then um, the other way to go is ideological, which would lead you towards J.D. Vance, and he's very popular on the right, and he's very smart, but he's also in an important position in Ohio as a senator. Um, I hadn't considered. To your point about competency, like I think, again, I think we have to do a much better job. We who speak in the media, we who are pollsters, we who are into politics have to do a much better job of understanding normal Americans. And normal Americans, I think, look this as, I think what you said, a competency crisis. Yeah, he's old. He stumbles. I'm talking about Biden. And yes, it's crazy ideologically, but they just want somebody who represents America competently. And I have to learn more about Haggerty, but... Uh, if he has an impressive business background, I know he's a politician as well now, but I, I just kind of like that idea of, you know, people that understand how to get things done, who have the right, the right ideological bent, but are so competent. Yeah, look him up. I mean, again, Boston Gonzalez, in full disclosure, I don't do any work for him. Um, I, I, I'm addressing one of many people today. He's got his... Uh, uh, supporters for, and people from all around D.C. here, but I do that routinely for all kinds of senators. But again, I'm just saying because, look, politics is not about biology or even chemistry. It's about math and science. You just need more electoral votes than the other person. <laughs> and it would be great to have this one, that one, the other one. I hope we see a female president in our lifetime, just not the ones who have run so far and not the vice president we currently have on the left. Um, but President Trump, he's being very deliberative about this process. He's cast a wide net. His short list will continue to be long. He may surprise everyone. Yeah, um, he may go with one of the more obvious choices from, that he's been considering from the very beginning. But Will Kane, not for a lack of vetting and thoughtfulness and depth. And um, you know, everybody says, "Who will help, help me win? Who will help me govern?" is incredibly important. And when President yeah. Trump, if he were to get back there, just quickly, you know, when you think about uh, El Baghdadi and Soleimani and a nuclear capable Iran at bay and pushing back on Putin and Xi Jinping and, and Kim Jong-un. We need somebody who's going to reinforce that as well. And that could be many people, there's no doubt. But I don't think it has to be a governor, or a senator, or a woman, or a minority. It's he, he can choose whoever he wants. And then you've got the Democrats stuck, stuck with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, unless, of course, what we discussed earlier comes true. And then they're just stuck with their record in the form of a new messenger. I didn't know you, Kellyanne Conway, but it makes sense, at least to some extent, are a fan of wrestling and went, went at least went to WrestleMania. I think if you were, I, I wish I would have known you were there, but that that uh, that would have been a fun thing. I think it's at uh, Kellyanne. I think it's at the bottom of everything, like politics, entertainment, culture. You Ultimately, look at the you get babyface versus heel. Babyface versus heel. Um, a big fight after a big show. I mean. It's wrestling. It's America. It's a cultural zeitgeist. You got to right. look at the cultural touchstones to realize what's happening. And uh, yeah. I, I like to say for years, I wasn't a political pollster. I was a cultural anthropologist. Most of our clients were non-political. They were consumer America, Major League Baseball, American Express. I used to work for all these different Martha Stewart Living's uh, on the media, media company. And that you learn the way people make decisions, how they spend their time, how they spend their money, what they do when no one's looking. And if you show me how people spend their weekend, I can probably tell you roughly how they're going to vote. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Let's do that next time. I want you to give me a proxy for a couple weekends and what that means for how they vote. Kellyanne Conway, always great to talk to you. Thank you, Kellyanne. Great to see you, Will. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. It doesn't fail to live up to expectations. It's incredible. It's a show. It is WrestleMania next on The Will Kane Show.
Stay on top of the latest forecast with America's weather team in the palm of your hands. Here's the latest from America's Weather Center. It's Fox weather updates throughout your busy day, every day. Five inches of rain by tomorrow. Temperatures being 30 degrees above average. Put the power of over 100 meteorologists and the worldwide resources of Fox in your hands with the Fox Weather Podcast. Precise, personal, powerful. Subscribe and listen now at foxnewspodcasts.com. It was the Hollywood murder trial that captivated America. Now, the Menendez brothers are back in the spotlight, and Fox Nation is bringing you a shocking docuseries with new evidence and new perspective on the case. There are real people at the heart of this story. Were abuse allegations overlooked? They couldn't imagine a father abusing his sons. Was their fate already sealed? I said, oh my God, this is rigged. And is there a case now to set the Menendez brothers free? The Menendez brothers, victims or villains, streaming now on Fox Nation. From the Fox News Podcasts Network. I'm Ben Dominich, Fox News contributor and editor of the Transom.com daily newsletter. And I'm inviting you to join a conversation every week with the smartest thinkers out there about the issues Americans face and where we are going as a nation. This show will feature deep dive interviews with newsmakers and some of your favorite Fox News analysts. I hope you'll join me as we dive into the front. It's the Ben Dominich Podcast. Subscribe and listen now by going to foxnewspodcasts.com or wherever you download podcasts. It took five minutes, not even, had the entire family, both boys, and importantly, the wife at WrestleMania. Within the first couple of minutes, Drew McIntyre comes out to Scottish bagpipes and swords and followed by Seth Rollins with a Mardi Gras parade of at least 100 dancing down the catwalk towards the ring where she, my wife, turned to me and goes, this is awesome. It is a show. WrestleMania. It is the Will Kane Show, by the way. Streaming live at foxnews.com, on the Fox News YouTube channel, the Fox News Facebook page. Subscribe at Apple, Spotify, or on YouTube. He is the host of The Gun Show at OutKick. It is Mike Gunzelman here on the Will Kane Show. What's up, Guns? So, I'm blown away, man. I was yeah. a wrestling fan. I was a wrestling fan when I was a kid, right? And then, like everybody, right. there's probably going to be a lot of people in the comments here. Yeah. You know, grow up. I, I did. Right. And I kind of gravitated away from it. And I never went to a live event. And in a lot oh. of ways, it's made for TV. But oh. I went. Oh, man. Yeah. And let me tell you this something. This is the one to go to, care. my man. This is the one to go to. What a weekend you had. <laughs> I don't care if you're into movies, Broadway, sporting events. It's like a combination of all of those done at an incredibly high level that you don't have to even, if you know the stories, it makes it better, but you don't have to be some massling wrestling fan to go, this is incredible. This is a show. Yeah. No, Will, you're exactly right. I mean, there really is nothing like it. And I, you know, I'm kind of the same way. And I'm sure a lot of, you know, the viewers and listeners are as well, where it's, you know, you grow up, you're like, oh yeah, like wrestling's great. Cause you don't really understand it all. And then you get older, it may, maybe fades away a little bit, but what's really incredible with the WWE is they're really bringing it back that all these people that might've you know, fallen off are coming back because you had the likes of the rock, for example. And then last night you had John Cena show up and the undertaker came out of nowhere. So they're perfectly mixing and matching some of the greatest names to ever do it. That the casual person out there knows with also these, the younger audience coming up that knows a Roman reigns and knows Cody Rhodes and more. And, there, there truly is nothing like it, but also what's great about it, it's a story as old as time, where it's the good guy, yeah. the face, versus the bad guy, the heel, and whether it's politics, whether it's your local high school baseball match, whatever it might be, whether it's true life and family and friendships and relationships, it's all together in a sports entertainment spectacle. And when you're there and you just were, my man, like people screaming and the chants and the signs and generational. Oh, yeah. It's uh, it's wild. It truly really is wild. Like nobody's too cool it's like, to not enjoy wrestling. Nobody's too cool. I don't care it, what you might say. You're not too cool to go to a live event. The, the, the crowd, you bring up the crowd. 
it's a little bit like European soccer. You know, have you you watch European soccer and the whole yes. crowd starts singing in unison? We don't really yeah. do that at football or basketball games. Or they they begin a chant where everybody knows what they're. And it's awesome because each wrestler has a catchphrase or something that he does in a fight, and the crowd knows, and they become part of the show because they're yelling his yeah 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 or whatever it is. Um, and the, you know what else they did? The crowd would break into random, you in unison chants of "This is awesome!" Like right. they're loving it to the extent of publicly proclaiming "This is awesome" in the middle of an event. I've never seen yeah. anything like that. It, it 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 truly is awesome what you're able to do, but also the the wrestlers they can feel that energy you like kind of just like you know just like the soccer matches as you said there's really nothing like that when you come to uh any in american sports here where you know i mean football you know can take forever or whatnot and like or just games in general this is like you are drawn in you come to this and you're able to escape the bs that is reality these days and let's be honest i think we all need to do that sometimes and the, just like the chaos the and the you know how everything's so crazy out there in the real world and just have fun at a wrestling event, and I mean, listen, you are uh, you're Will Kane. The fact that a diehard Dallas Cowboys fan was willing to go to Philadelphia and deal with, like who the heck ever <laughs> wants to go to Philly? I don't want to go to Philadelphia ever. This place is a cesspool as far as I'm concerned with crime and everything. But you know what? WrestleMania will bring me there. WrestleMania brought Will I, Kane, I, a diehard I, Cowboys fan, to Lincoln Financial Field. Let's go. I've never – it's funny. I've never watched the Cowboys play at the link, and it's it's funny to think now I've been to the link, and it's in the safest possible environment I could go, which is a huge fight, <laughs> WrestleMania. Yes. If I go to a football game, my life will be in danger at the link. Yeah, um, Listen, yeah hey, it's, Okay, it's so you're right. Yeah, 145,000 people. So it set, it set a record there. And, you know, it, it's really interesting because whether you are – like there's a bigger story than this. The fact that like The Rock and, you know, came back was a, a, a tremendous story there on the wrestling aspect. But also from a media standpoint, the WWE coming off that massive Netflix deal where there it's a five billion dollar deal with Netflix over the next ten years. That's in, that just shows how big this sports entertainment and the world is getting. I mean, Netflix of course is king, but when they're dropping five billion on a product, listen, it's uh, it's it's not all just people doing choreographed moves and all that. There's a real push and power behind a force such as WWE right now. So the choreograph thing, by the way, I don't care. And I, yeah. it's, it's, I get it because I did care. It's ridiculous the moves they're doing and the athleticism and <laughs> how they're not yeah. hurt more seriously. I mean, it really yeah. is ridiculous because we're talking about 260-pound men flying 15 feet off the ground onto not concrete but pretty hard surfaces. Yeah. But here, here's my thing real quick. You, you said it's an escape, and it is an escape. But, you know, I overthink things. So – but I don't think I'm overthinking it because I think everybody's thinking this. It is such a proxy for reality or for America. So I was watching it, and first of all, right when Drew McIntyre, and he's gigantic, comes out. And then, yeah. you know, there's a lot of guys after him that also do this. You're like, that's a real-life superhero. Like, just his body, how big he is. How You're like, that's what they do in movies to make, you know, like Robert Downey Jr. Yeah. Like they're like the look Avengers. like a superhero. Yeah. But yeah. this guy's yeah. body is it, so it, it becomes real life superheroes, and then the characters, like when Cody Rhodes comes out, you know, American Nightmare, and everything's America themed. By the way, the minute that happened, I'm, I'm like, he's winning. I mean, we kind of oh. knew that would happen anyway, but like, this is a moment for America, you know. Yeah. And <laughs> and I don't know, I, I just think it's like distilled down into so many of these these proxies for values, and like you said, good guy, bad guy, America. And by the way, on on my Hour-long conversation with The Rock. He and I talked about this. Um, a, a, an old guy, wor uh, not he wasn't old, but a, a couple years ago when I was working with a guy at ESPN and they did storytelling at E60, he said to me, uh, heroes are uninteresting, villains are interesting. Luke Skywalker is boring, Darth Vader is compelling. <laughs> and yes. he said, Steph Curry is boring, Draymond Green is interesting. And he's right. Like, there's layers to villains. And, you know, here's The Rock now. He's a villain. And it's, I don't know, there's just so much deeper in everything that looks like cartoonish showmanship. There's more going on, I think, when you pay attention to WWE. The the writers can't, uh, the, the writers and, and, and it, it, we just want to be able to feel something. And that's, and to be able to do that as a wrestler is a sign of a, of, of a great wrestler. You want to be able to draw in, whether it's the casual or the, uh, or the diehard fan out there. 
And these are the best of the best. You're talking WrestleMania 40. So to get to this level, there's millions of wrestlers all across the globe. So to get here, you are talking about the best of the best that are perfect at their craft. But like you said about the whole, uh, you know, bringing in people just want to be able to to feel something and whether it's like sergeant slaughter versus the iron sheik back in the day remember like they like and how everyone's like we were so pro sergeant slaughter mm -hmm. and just like pro america and that brought in like real life uh real life storylines into the world of sports entertainment and what's great about this is whether in real life perhaps things might not turn out the way they do you know in the long run a person like Cody Rhodes, who continually kept losing and kept having his opportunities taken away from him, was able to defeat the villain, The Rock. And it feels good when something like that happens. Because, because you know, from, from, from just watching the storyline and being invested in it, man. Totally. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. Like, it so was, and and the fact that, yeah, the, the Rock came back. For those that don't know, The Rock hasn't wrestled in forever. I mean, The Rock is The Rock. He's 51 years old. You had that great interview with them, made a ton of headlines, by the way. Congrats on that. Uh, you, you, you were the only one to ask him those questions. So I got to give my man Will Kane props here because you had the, uh, the cojones to do it, my man. And that's what we come to expect from you. Very cool stuff there. But The Rock wasn't going to come back to wrestling and not just be a celebrity, but actually wrestle unless it was worth it. And that just shows how much, um, how well wrestling is doing right now. And it's only going to get bigger. It's only going to continue to it get does bigger. Feel, inter international push and all that, it's only going to get bigger. It does feel like like it's on a huge upswing rise. And I mean, I think it was illustrated last night by the main event where John Cena is a huge star. He basically played a cameo last night. And he was, it was awesome when he comes out. You know, The Undertaker, The Rock. I mean, incredible, like, I, there was a guy in front of me who was clearly a big wrestling fan, and I heard him say at some point during that fight, he goes, this is the best WrestleMania ever. <laughs> and then by the end of the fight, he goes, this is the best event I've ever been to ever. So I don't know what he was including there, <laughs> like like Super Bowls or football or basketball. Helpless, I don't know what yeah. he was talking about, but... And he yeah. was blown. He was blown away. As was I. It lived up to expectations. And That's very by the way, cool, we got to find out now if the eclipse is going to live up to expectations. So we got to head outside here in a moment, yeah. Gun. So check you out the you, Gun you know Show. It probably at won't Outkick. live up to expectations like The Rock did. I can tell you that much. <laughs> but hey, you never know unless you know. Like Will Kane going to a wrestling event. That was a huge wrestling fan. Next time they're at Madison Square Garden, me and you, my man, we're going. We're going to party. Drinks on me, Will Kane. Let's go, baby. We'll get awesome. t-shirts. Thank you. We'll rock and roll. We'll chant. We'll do it all my man let's go we'll k oh. <laughs> His own promo right there. Check out the gun show, by the way, at Outkick. All right, thank you, Mike, so much. Appreciate you. All right, well, I mean, maybe the Eclipse will live up to expectations. Maybe it won't. Maybe it's the beginning of the end. Let's go find out. Let's go outside. Get ready for the total eclipse of the sun. Remember, go check out my hour-long interview with The Rock, uh, YouTube, uh, hit subscribe while you're there, and you get this. Look, everybody's paying attention. To that. We've done that with Stephen A. Smith. We've done that with Dave Portnoy. We've done that with Tony Rollins. We've done that um, with Jordan Peterson. We have been doing the hour long, deep conversation you rarely can get anywhere else. And I promise you'll get it here on the Will Kane Show. So we'll see you on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and I will see you again next time. Mm -hmm.